name is Martin Jan, for those of you who don't know me. Um, so it's a great pleasure and honor to welcome you here today and to welcome our guest, Mr. Ajit Singh. He's the chairman of uh, ACG uh, International, um, which is an Indian multi multinational company. Um, we are hosting him today in the context of ZSM Business Forum. As most of you already know, uh, in the context of that forum, we have had an honor to uh, host uh, a large number of very prominent uh, guests, prominent entrepreneurs, politicians, uh, policy makers, and others. So we are very happy to have you here today with us. Um, the topic of our today's presentation is extremely interesting, so not every day do you have to we get to have a chance to host uh, a chairman, so the head of a, a multinational company, global multinational company, uh, but not only that, an Indian multinational company. So uh, as most of you know quite well, India over the last uh, 10 to 15 years became uh, not only uh, a global force in the world, but there was, there was another difference that I would like to emphasize. So India changed from a country that uh, predominantly uh, attracted uh, foreign capital to a country that uh, over the last few years has become very active on global markets in terms of uh, acquiring assets. So nowadays, more and more you will hear about stories about Indian entrepreneurs going abroad, uh, going away from India, internationalizing and acquiring uh, foreign assets. So I'm, heard, I'm sure you, most of you have heard about uh, the, the stories of Tata acquiring the, the uh, British car manufacturer uh, Jaguar, Jaguar exactly, Land Rover, or the Astro Metal that uh, is today a, a global company but uh, started from India. And these are just a few examples. So in that context, we are very happy to hear uh, uh, another, in a way, a similar story of. Uh, of your company, where you also started out from India and uh, expanded globally, and not only that, but uh, decided to invest in Croatia. Um, the mantra these days, some, uh, and uh, all of you, all of you Croatian students uh, and, and other guests, I'm sure have you heard it many, many times. So the mantra that will save Croatia is the foreign direct investment, right? Our government keeps repeating those three words uh, all over. So. Uh, the case of uh, uh, the case we're going to talk about today is exactly that: a very successful foreign direct investment in Croatia. I've heard some impressive numbers that uh, Mr. Singh will repeat, but uh, the company ASG uh, from Croatia uh, is exporting 99% of its product uh, outside of Croatia, and uh, the the growth that they have uh, witnessed last year is 50%. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but these are some pretty staggering, impressive numbers. So, uh, we're very happy to hear your story, to hear the story about your company, and uh, without further ado, I'd like to um, offer you the floor. So, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm glad to see the gender ratio is very healthy. I want to say that apologies to my male friends that ladies are much brighter than men. Uh, I do a lot of work with pharmacy colleges in India. And believe it or not, 70 to 80 percent of the intake in and graduates are ladies. So I'm really glad to see that many of you here. I believe you're going to go out into the business world, and um, I wish you the very best of luck. Uh, we got, yes, our company is called ACG. It stands for Indian Consulting Castle Group, and we uh, have now grown quite big with the original photograph. It was supposed to be right at the beginning. Uh, this is what we looked like when we started. Um, we came back to India in the mid-60s, uh, having been trained uh, in the best universities in the world. My brother is an engineer, and I go around telling everyone what a good job he's doing. So we make a very good combination. Uh, but when we came back, we found that uh, 
Uh, there was a license applied for by our family, and a small factory was just coming up. We looked around India, we noticed the following things. We said, look, most people who are like us, we prefer to leave India. In those days, there was a big emigration from the USA and Europe, and join IBM, other institutions, levers, and so on. But we looked at India, and we found a country with a vast possible market. We also saw that the sun shines almost every day, certainly on a regular basis. We saw that the people, <coughs> relatively simple, but highly talented, particularly in engineering, IT, mathematics, synthetic chemistry, the bathtub in my mother's apartment where we stayed has said shanks of England. Can you imagine even a bathtub would not be made in India. And finally, of course, we were both bachelors and we found that the women in India were the most beautiful in the world. So we decided to stay on and make our future in India. Forty years later, many Indians want to come back. Things are a little tougher now, it's much more competitive, standards require the higher, the customer is much more discerning, uh, you have to really compete in the market. So we had plenty of time to really establish ourselves well. So if I come in today, I really also enjoy a different scenario, and we probably have to use different techniques to try and succeed. So to get to our first factory, we had to go in a horse and carriage to reach there about four kilometers from the railway station. And uh, nobody spoke English for miles around. Now you can see that as a big disadvantage, and you can see it as an advantage. The advantage, which I would like to see, is that we had nothing to do but work. Nothing to do but learn how to run a small factory. We had about 18 people working for us. That's almost the entire staff and their children and their dogs. And we learned how to run a factory on three ships, seven days a week. This is a secret. Once you do that, your output to capital ratio goes double or triple. You don't need that much capital or space. You give more employment, of course, which is good for the country. We, uh, we learned how to market not with fancy marketing technologies, which uh, we had learned abroad, but by picking up your bag, taking your samples, and going to the medicine market, and selling maybe $200, $500 worth of capsules, we make empty capsules for the pharma industry, or uh, collect $100 from here and there. So you learned from the bottom up. If you came to our factory in about 1967 or 68, you can see Mr. Jasveer Singh was our managing director and a brilliant design engineer, working in workers' clothes, under a machine, 2 o'clock on Monday morning, early morning, getting the machine ready to run on Sunday morning. So there's nothing we don't know about the businesses we're in. We're in three basic industries, capsules, machinery for pharma and food, and packaging. From very humble beginnings, uh, we have grown to the second largest capsule producer in the world. We have grown to the largest producer in the world in four of our engineering items. And we are rapidly catching up with it. Our average growth rate in India is 20 to 25% a year. <coughs> our, uh, there are two companies, and one company in capsule is bigger than us. They are growing at about 3% a year. And God knows how much of that is price increase, not volume. So we've drawn a map which shows where we're going to become number one in the world. Now, Marco runs a company here, uh, Blue Caps and Good Break. Uh, in the last three, four years that we've been there, putting in new higher speed machines and with his great management skills, we have already made Croatia the third the largest producer of capsules in Europe. And we, Marco and we have agreed that in three or four years, we will be the second largest producer of capsules in Europe. Capsules going to France, Germany, Finland, Sweden, uh, UK, uh, Italy, Spain, uh, 
definitely even after Turkey, the USA, and uh, Russia. These are markets that we were already serving from India. When this new baby of ours came up, we transferred some of the business we already had. So about 70% of the uh, of the capacity got built up. And the other 30% they pushed and got their own. So let's move on. That's a pretty brief history of how the group grew. Next week. And that's the range of products that we make today. As I said, there's three main products. But with those three products, we supply almost everything a farmer company needs anywhere in the world for the most popular solid dosage form, which is a solid dosage form, which means tablets and capsules. So you'll see here, we start with empty capsules, but we make capsule filling machines also. Very few people do that in the world. We then go on to blister packing machinery, but we make blister packing film as well. Not the low cost, but the high cost, high barrier added, sophisticated film, which we're going to bring to Croatia next. Then we do cartoning and we do inspection systems with cartoning. On the tablet machinery, we do tablet tooling. On the inspection systems is required right through the group. Innovative packaging solutions. Inspection systems are now the range. Every farmer company, most food companies need, by law almost, inspection systems. Make sure the right label is gone on the right pack and so on. And we moved into that business about three years ago and we have really coming out as a world force in that area. So let's move on. We have partnered with world leaders for products that we don't make. We can't make everything under the sun, but our customers want much more than we can make because we have an established brand name in many countries and they trust us. And our people are visiting the customer every two weeks or every week. We, we tell our bankers or any banker, do you want to credit appraisal note on, your, on a farmer customer come to us. Don't look up their balance sheets which are 18 months old. So we, we go into a farmer company, we go and see their factory, we go to their stores, we can tell you on a weekly basis whether that company is going to collapse or it's going to grow fast. Next. So uh, you saw that little factory, it won't even fit into the cafeteria and kitchen of anyone in the new factory. We have 15 factories. 3,600 workers, over 1,000 engineers, uh, and a nice research center. Uh, all our factories are located in beautiful gardens. One of our important um, values is aesthetics. You don't often see that in any company. So everything we want to do is aesthetic. Our products have to be aesthetic. Capsules, fortunately, aesthetic. Our machines have to be aesthetically designed and safe. We want to be the first in the world to make a green pharmaceutical machine. We're working on that as a research project. Our buildings are so designed that they're aesthetic. They don't, they don't look ugly in the countryside. We give you a sense of joy. Next thing. These are all the new factories coming up. The three engineering companies are all shifting to a place called Pune, about 20 minutes away from Bombay. Right? Uh, these are some of the very modern factories now coming up. See, once you get into the growth phase, you know, it takes you about eight, ten years of pretty hard work, unless you're really lucky with you or not. And then you find your companies are growing lives. We don't declare much dividends, we don't take much out of the company. We get a very good salary, we get a commission on profits. Uh, but all the money that is earned by each one of our companies belongs to the CEO, who is also a director of the company. Now the CEO must make his three or four year plans in advance on how to spend his money. That of course will be scrutinized by the holding company board, found okay, then he gets an okay one year or two years ahead. If that CEO hasn't done his planning properly, and he's unable to spend the money for two years, then the corporate office takes it away. We then put it in a bank, we earn 14% interest, early at the 17, and then we give it to some other company in the group who got plans to work. So we are we're not shy about telling our workers and even our union leader how much money the company is making. Most entrepreneurs would hide that information as they're making very good money. But we don't, we're very proud of it. 
everyone in the company feels responsible for making that profit. When we put up our budget and profit and loss account, which is against budget, everybody in the company knows whether we are behind or ahead. And if we are behind, everyone works together to meet or cross the budget, which is usually what happens. You see, if you don't tell your people where they are in terms of your goals, it's like <coughs> playing football, but don't tell your players where the goal goes. Let them hit the ball anywhere. Right? You don't want to tell them the secret of the goal post. But we inform our, everyone every month. It's on the board. This again, uh, heavy into engineering today, as I mentioned next week, and into packaging, right? into security systems, and into r and systems. We cover almost everything a farmer can do. These are some of our international customers. You might be familiar with some of these names. Right? Right? These are all the international associations that we've brought into India. We do an annual conference or two with their help. We bring in the world's leading scientists to our research center. And then we help them with government work, submissions to the government. We help them join government committees so India gets the best brains in the world working on their new edition of their new pharmacopoeia. Now there's a lot of work going on in health and dietary supplements. Every government in the world is trying to figure out, is this a pharma or is this a food? So we brought in an organization called the International Association of Dietary Supplements. 70 branches around the world, we a branch in India, an research center, and, uh, and we set up an organization called Health and Dietary Supplements Association, which serves on various government committees. Next, please. We, uh, without these associations, we ourselves train over 2,000 Pharma personnel every year. Why do we do it? Hey, we love education and training, but these are also our customers. And a bond builds up between you and your customer. Please you remember this as an entrepreneur. A bond builds up between you and your customer, and over a period of time, you are no longer a supplier. You are a colleague that's helping them in their work and helping them how to expand their horizons in terms of technology and marketing and so on. It's very important to be seen like that. Our salespeople, when they go to meet a customer, <coughs> there's already five people from other companies waiting in the waiting room. When his card goes in, he's called in first. Now that's, that has pride in this company. We may not have a 5,000 million dollar turnover, but we're we're definitely ahead of most companies in areas which matters to our people. And I would list all those things which we tell our people what to talk about in a party. Because again, outside the pharma industry, we're not well known. We're not a public company yet, so the public doesn't know our, our we're not a consumer product, so the public doesn't pick up our products. So how do you then in society, as a member of this company, we call all our employees, we call them associates. As an associate in ACG, how do you make an impact at a party? I know that's important. You give your card, nobody knows who you are, who your company is. So what do you say in the next two or three minutes that makes people makes people attentive to what you do and, and how well the company is doing? Next thing. So we have a number of cash and cards now, the latest being in no, the yes, the latest in Bombay. Uh, in central India, but the last one before that was in Croatia, and uh, there are more than 25,000 machines, of which about uh, about 15,000 are repeat installations. Again and again, for the same customers. But we get so many new customers all around the world, and we usually there first. It's important to be the first. Next. That's now roughly the turnover. Our first five years turnover was hitting, I don't know, about $200,000 or half a million dollars. And then I say after the 10th year, it would really take off. Most of our groups are export oriented. The Croatia plant exports 99% of its production. Now, what's, it's quite remarkable actually that in the product that we make here at UCAS, Croatia has no natural advantage. 
you know, we can understand if somebody, entrepreneur, comes to Croatia and says, you know, there's tremendously good fruit and vegetables and jams and meat, and I can testify to that. I'm taking back 10 kilos to <laughs> India. <laughs> so why don't I get into the food industry? Like one or two <coughs> companies, with a government company, somebody to start in the private sector, and that would make sense. You have very good supplies of wood, wherever you get it from, and your furniture has big business. And the Italians would come here, and then you have a natural resource to make furniture and export it. Uh, um, shipping could be highly developed now that you're in the EU. Uh, it's a natural advantage. Russia has so much coastline. So you can look at a number of industries where there is a natural advantage to be in Croatia, and so you can say, yes, that fellow succeeded because he was using the natural advantages. But when you have a product line and an entrepreneur who comes all the way from India, he doesn't know Europe very well, and he goes into a business where there are no natural advantages in Croatia, and then he succeeds, then that's a signal for the rest of the world that you can come to Croatia. There's a magic about Croatia, I can tell you the advantages, but they're not natural resources. Unless you found people as the greatest renewable natural resource of all, and the people we have found quite, quite terrific. Okay, so next please. Okay, so that's a pro global presence as of about two years ago. We have offices in many countries. We have plants now in Croatia, another one coming up in Brazil. The land is being purchased after that in China. And that's our firm three-year plan. It's already fixed. And the funds are being arranged and people being hired already and so on. Next, please. So, we talk about Lucas for a minute. We had a small plant when we started. It's about double the size. We grew by 60% last year in volume. There's no demand in Croatia. And there'll be an average of 40% every year, you can see, for the next five years. We're putting a lot more money in. We're bringing in the latest design plants. Everything developed in our research center. And we have about 40 patents till now. It's available to our plant, our baby in Croatia, which is now a young lad. It's available there. They have to come to India and say, I want this and I want that. And now you have a new design of machine, you have a new process. Take it away. We're very open, very transparent. Next. Oh yeah, that's a bad photograph. But uh, there we are, we were very lucky. Your former president came and inaugurated our expanded factory. It uh, cleared up a lot of red tape that we were facing. Mm -hmm. The local bureaucrats what all disappeared it? overnight. Mm -hmm. He is very, great, very good to us. Thank you. Next. And uh, okay, so this is uh, something which uh, will be faced next week. Then, of course, we. Uh, we did a lot of funding from India to get salary increases through provide bonuses once again. One thing which uh, sticks in the whole memory of Lundre is when one of our associates got sick and went to hospital, he had some sort of accident. <coughs> our head of HR, the name was to Mr. Asana, flew from India from Bombay to here and nursed him. Not nursed him, white nursed him, but he sat by that side brought in groups and vegetables. You know, nobody had ever done that in any factory in North Russia before. It was, it was an amazing, uh, uh, I think, demonstration of making sure that people who are best resource are looked after. Next. Next. This is interesting. I know of very few companies who have invested abroad who don't keep the an accounting guy there, right? Report back separately. Or somebody else there. But if you look at the last expert from India left a year ago. And I'm very proud to say that not for Fraser or our program. <laughs> Brilliant manager. Really. You should really. And uh, doing a great job, taking the financial growth 60% a year, 40% the next. We are showing what Croatia can do. 
You don't have to have natural advantages. For God's sake, don't try and take money from the government. <laughs> Why do you need money? Right? Uh, do not ask for handouts because you are crippling yourself from the beginning. You are not thinking big enough. You are thinking only what you can get. Companies that go to a certain location due to tax advantages also make a big error and used to make this in the early days. You go to a tax benefit area, you can retain good people. Critical. You hire good people in India, there's millions without a job. But after two or three years, their wives don't like it anymore and they go away. So actually what you thought would get you a lot of extra profit <coughs> you pay no tax, you actually end up in a much worse situation. And for the next 10 or 15 years, you're in a desolated area, your transport costs more, you can't get good engineers to come and repair your equipment, so it's a mistake. What MNCs do generally is much cleverer. They say, we will go to where we can find good people and retain good people. When and if we make good profits, we'll find out how to save on tax later. But we don't want to plan to save on tax before we even make any profit. Next. So these are some of the new products we hope to bring in to Croatia. And uh, this is, we already mentioned this, it's the first investment from India in Croatia. What is interesting is, we figured out how long it takes to fly from London to Ukraine and from Germany and from France and from Italy and so on. Our biggest competitor is here. He's number two in Europe at the moment. We are number three. And in our brochures, we seek to prove to our customers that Lucas is not a far away place. It's not, Zagreb is nearer than in Madrid and easy to get to. And the roads are terrific. So, we want to dispel this myth that Croatia has run far power of Europe. It's very much there. It's such an amazing location for Italy, or, uh, for um, even for Germany, <coughs> for Russia. And of course for the USA, we are halfway to the USA compared to India. Okay, next. You know, I'm going through all this, I didn't really mean to, but what I'm trying to do is create a sense of credibility, right? That we have done it. And therefore, what I'm really going to come to, a great part of my lecture, we will listen to a little more carefully. I say this is not all theory. And there's, there's something that we can learn from this speech. So, okay, so let's move on. That's good. Okay. We are uh, bring a train full of doctors, 60 doctors. We bring them to the rural areas near our factories and we do four to 500 operations in the course of eight or 10 days. Villagers, tribals who never had proper medical attention. And then we move on to another location. It's called the Lifeline Express. We, we visited by various ministers who look at the, the work we're doing for social welfare. Thanks, people. We didn't seek all this, but it follows you. You, know, you do the right work and things follow you. We employed, uh, we employed a lot of physically handicapped people. When we first started, our biggest problem was managers and supervisors. They couldn't see anything noble in it. They found a big nuisance value. They said, why do you want to hire us to hire a physically handicapped when there's millions of unemployed people in India? And we you know, have come from Europe in the West. We were a bit socialistic in our approach. And we told them, you wait and see. And in six months, those physically handicapped people had been transformed into loyal workers, much more hardworking than able-bodied, because they knew that they would not get a job like this. Either. They moved from being a burden on their families and looked down on to becoming the most highly paid person in, the, in their company. Six or eight of them got married every year. They had no chance of finding a wife. And you should see the pride in their eyes and their faces when they work. And of course the best recognition you can get about whether you are any good is not from the government, not from your table of farmers, 
all those awards can be manipulated. But an award that your customers association gives you cannot be manipulated. But there, the, that's the moment of truth. You know, if your customer gives you an award, it means something to us. Anything else? Thanks. Yeah. Those of you who work with us, you're entitled to a beautiful villa as a holiday home. It fits 20 people. We use it for our training programs. We use it for our corporate planning and, and monthly planning and so on. And it's free more than 60% of the time when people can take their families and go there. You spend some of the company money in buying properties all day. By the way, those are even better than our company in terms of increase of value. And uh, so wherever our engineers go for installing machines with the customers, they have an option of staying in a guest house, so very cheap, very free, wonderful books and reservations and transportation. So if any of you come to India on a some form of stipend uh, training, you know that you can get a trip around India and not pay much money. Stay in the guest house. Next please. So this is uh, this is our vision and mission statement. And we have uh, with our this is, yeah. we couldn't put this on the slides. Uh, this is really prepared last night. Uh, so, and thanks to Ketan Parman, my executive assistant. But we couldn't fit this on. This we have at the end of every email and letter the words comes in. And under it, these are the values we have. We have a vision, we have a mission. The really most important values is here and now. And the values transcend stands for transparency, which I've already talked about. It doesn't only mean in terms of the financial results, but it being transparent. Aesthetics, you won't find that in any other. It's a value for us, and I explained to you why our building, our machinery, and the, the, how people behave, and everything has to be aesthetic. Nurturing, critically important. Every manager should nurture his team. Why do people leave companies? Keith, why do people leave companies? Love it. So the manager leaving, they join companies because of the company. Well, yes, you, you join a company, but you leave because of your loss. Uh, and uh, that's really true. You're going to find that as a big problem, that bad bosses are poison to an organization. Bad bosses steal the credit that is due to you. Your idea, but they'll go to the meeting and say, it's my idea. They will downgrade you if they feel you're a competitor. So we try to crush all these things which creep into a company, the bureaucratic issues as your company gets bigger. Safety, obvious, not often expressed. Um, synergy, because we are a group. All our products interact with each other. And if each company can help the other, we have the same end customers, we get much more business. In fact, we like to think about ourselves as an octopus. And any one of our octopus tentacles reaches into a customer, it pulls the rest of the group together. And why customers like to deal with us is after we supply the machinery, we also hope to get the orders for the consumables. They feel much more secure. So they constantly owe us money so they make sure the machines will run good. Right? and for a long time. Customer centric, very, very important. You have to be close to your customers at all times. There's only one moment of truth in the activity of a company. <coughs> that moment of truth is when you are in front of a customer or when a customer visits your factory. The rest is all, I'm going to use an impolite word, it's all bullshit. What you advertise, what you give lectures on, what you promote through exhibitions, is all the show. The reality comes when you're in front of a customer and what sort of service you're giving him, how well you manage to convince him of your product and become your long-term customer. Empowering, again, this is more internal as well as external. You should try and empower your employee, your people working under you as well as others in the company and of course your customers. We empower by training 2,000 pharmaceutical professionals a year in our own research center and they know it. 
But finally, dignity. Without dignity, it's not worth it. Maybe not even worth living. Okay, now, let's come to the more exciting part of the talk. Is everyone totally bored? <laughs> Can I go on for another 20 minutes or 30 minutes? Because this is what I'm going to talk about, and that is winning in business. What MBA should know, let me know, uh, which colleges seldom teach, with your apologies now, <laughs> but which you guys should know. And this is hidden secrets of entrepreneurship. You will not necessarily need to read in magazines or books. It's all based on our own experience. Some of it may overlap with what's written somewhere, but it's come from our own experience. Now, all of you would like to go global, like our company has gone global. And you have to do quite a lot of training of your people to make them think globally. So, we started doing elaborate training programs on etiquette, how to recognize good wine, how to eat a steak, and have table manners, and how to dress well, etc. How to speak foreign languages. And after a while, we said, you know, is this really true? Why oh, should we learn foreign languages? Everyone speaks English. It's stupid. If somebody from Germany tried to learn Hindustani and then spoke to our people in India trying in a stupid Hindustani to sell us his product, we said, my God, why doesn't he just speak in English? So now we, we get everyone good English and good business English is very important. So for us, what does going global mean today? And I guess this applies as much to Croatia in some ways as it does to us in India. Say what you mean and mean what you say. This is what integrity is largely about when you go to countries like the USA, UK, Germany, France, and what I've done. It, I was at Cambridge <coughs> University in England, um, and over there you learn that integrity is an attitude. It does not apply only to money matters. It does not apply, apply to your discreetly subverting the company's time, assets, and goodwill to serve your own ends. That also is done while it's integrity. And we could carry on and on. But I'll go on to the next point. And the next point is being on time. For Indians, this is great cultural shift to be on time. So, even the Indian calendar is reading 1857. <laughs> so, we have to give them a lot of training that you have to be always at least six to seven minutes early for an appointment. I know Marco is laughing at me and I've been late for three years. Once I've had all this, all this work to do. All right. Be six to seven minutes early. Do not be one minute late. Do not even be on time. Reason is simple. As soon as you suppose it's at seven, and it's seven, if it's a German or European you're trying to service, he starts looking at his watch. And he's having a pretty hard time. He's miserable. He thinks you're inefficient. He thinks you don't respect him. Just like six to seven minutes early. When I'm meeting a, a big client, and I come seven minutes early, He's come 10 minutes early and we won't leave for dinner. Both feeling that we are all worthy of each other. You know, we come on time. Once I arrived 45 minutes late for a meeting, I was with one of my company presidents and we had the chance of tying up with Germany's largest and the world's largest manufacturer of packaging films. This is before we made our own factory and painstakingly developed our own technology. Now it was raining. These are, these are days before the cell phone. We knew we were going to be 20 or 30 minutes late, but we were panic stricken. We drove into a petrol pump, we couldn't get through the company. Finally, we'd been invited there to take a tour of the plant and so on. And we had arrived 45 minutes late. First, we were kept waiting 15 minutes. Nobody came to see us. Then, the president of the company came down and said, oh, you arrived. Said, Do you have anything to tell me? 
but I wanted to ask for a cup of coffee. And then he sorts out. The deal was over. I mean, he was not interested because we didn't arrive on time. And here's another secret. We didn't inform him. If you can inform the person you're going to be late and inform him even 10 minutes before that miserable time when he starts worrying, 70% of the damage is avoided. That's my experience. Now, being on time is a is an attribute that is drummed into you at the Harvard Business School. They have a, something called a BAC, WSC, called Britain Assignment. In addition to three case studies a day, they give you an 80 page case study and then for you to write an essay on it. Nobody tolerates typing it. Every day has to be typewritten, which is a nuisance in those days. Nobody used to type. And you have to deposit your written assignment at the back of a vehicle with a basket and at 6 p.m. At 6 p.m. that vehicle starts moving away. And you see boys and girls rushing out to the vehicle to try to drop the back in. If it doesn't go in, you get zero marks for that week. Zero. It's like me getting zero at that world's largest film club. Zero. The importance of being on time. Due to the pressure the Harvard Business School imposes on all its students, five of the five percent of them <coughs> rack up in the last three months. I've seen two brothers actually becoming mental during those three months. These who really suffer are the high flyers in their undergraduate years in another college somewhere around the world. The Harvard Business School does not prefer to take people who get a first class in their universities. They don't. They feel that this attribute of getting high academic scores is not very relevant to successful entrepreneurship. Howard prefers college graduates with a high to medium second class degree. They give you preference. Also, definitely two to four years experience with the manufacturing or commercial organization, otherwise they won't take it. I have one year's experience and I scraped, managed to get in, but today you need two, three, four years experience. And it's very important you have that. If you go to a great business school like Harvard, you know, if you've gone straight from college, you don't have the maturity to strike up a personal relationship with a lecturer who you really admire. And once you're a little more mature, you get so much more of it because everything you learn through a case study, you're able to remember something similar that happened to you when you were working in an industrial business. And when you speak up, Harvard has 90 students in a classroom like this, it's a semi-secular. The principal, the professor waves his arms and moves around and uh, there's no right answer. You have no right answer in business or interpretation. The answer is what you're prepared to work at to make it a success. So he will suddenly, and your name is already from him. So he suddenly say, Singh, you start the class today. It's always a 75 minute class because they believe after 75 minutes, your energy flags. So you have to start, and here's 90, 89 people looking at you. And you have to lead the class as to what you interpreted in that 40 page case study, which you have to do three every night. And my God, if you get it wrong, you see giggles and laughter around the classroom. It was not brilliant. And you get only one or two chances in a semester. And you get that wrong, you can write off your career at Harvard. Because Harvard believes that you have to be ready all the time. Never know when life calls upon you to seize a major opportunity. Not prepared, then you don't succeed. Now, incidentally, at Cambridge University, where I was before in England, you are not taught what Harvard teaches you at all. You're given a very easy life. 
you do most of the work in the library, you meet your tutor once a week. I was warned when I got there, my senior tutor, Mr. Havindra, told me, said, Ajit, I believe in India, it is compulsory to attend lectures, otherwise you don't get marked. Now over here, in Cambridge, I encourage you not to attend any lectures, unless it's a brilliant professor who's speaking original thoughts. There was one professor of sociology, was so brilliant in America, that he had four stenographers writing down every word he said. It became his next book. In those days, they didn't have tape recorders. Now, so at Cambridge, you're taught, and now I'm being a little critical of Cambridge, you're taught how to think, but you're also taught how to sound very intelligent and use interspersed your conversation with a lot of abstruse words that everyone is to rush and look up in the dictionary later on. <laughs> they teach you how to enjoy intellectual pursuits. They teach you about good wine and food, how to hold a glass of wine, how to recognize good champagne. Now at Harvard, they teach you something else. They teach you how to make the money to buy the good wine and the good champagne. As you see the difference. <laughs> now, when I returned to India, trying to be an entrepreneur in the Indian environment, I got all this stuff I'd learned abroad over six, seven years, it all had to get knocked out. Reality was different. Now, I worked uh, for a year in England after I finished at Cambridge and before going to Harvard. And I learned something that I think entrepreneurs or executives should particularly learn. And that is, learn how to have a sense of humor. You won't get far if you don't have a sense of humor. This doesn't mean laughing aimlessly, but it means that you appreciate something funny and at work, English people particularly are constant kidding, kidding each other. People know that very well. You are making fun of each other, but not in a malicious way, in a nice way. So both of you laugh. And that just makes working so much nicer. We have a target, a goal for our HR department. And we now have 3,600 people working there, 1,000 engineers. And our HR department's goal is to ensure creativity and fun at work. How we test them year after year, how do we know that our HR department is doing their job? When we know it, if all our people really want to come to work every day, they don't fall in, they want to come to work want to be able to exercise their creativity and they want to have the fun that every day begins. And there's a whole lot of activity which, which revolves around those two criteria and we could go into it at any time if you want to have your questions and so on. The next very important attribute of being an entrepreneur or to be a senior manager in a group is to be accountable feel responsible for everything. <coughs> it's the quickest way of attracting attention and getting a promotion or succeeding in business. In our business, we make the empty capsules. So one would imagine, we have a difficult product to make. So once you imagine that we make that product perfectly and we send it to the customer, then our accountability is over. It's not. In our case, it may be different in other types of businesses. We feel accountable from the minute a capsule is made, going backwards to where the bone and the skin is gathered in the villages, where it's processed in the factories of our suppliers, and where it's quality control tested, and when it comes to our factory, and then from a factory it goes to a pharma company, it's filled with the pharma company's medicines, then it goes to a distributor, 
Then it goes to a retailer. Finally, it goes to, let us say, a housewife who may consume part of the medicine after six months. We believe at ACD that the entire supply chain, the entire value chain, is our responsibility. And mind you, it makes for very good business. But when you delve that deeply into your supply chain, you know how to help your supplier improve his quality. Make him measure things that he didn't know how to measure. You know from your customer's point of view how the medicine is when it reaches a retailer. You find your competitor's product is spoiling the medicine. You never know otherwise. Your purchase manager is never going to tell you that. But you override all of them and go straight to the retail chemist, your dad. And then finally, to the consumer, the housewife. You know what we found? Many of our capsules go into blister packing. You know what that is, press through pack. Companies in India use PVC, which permits moisture to go in, but it's the cheapest pack. And we've been trying to persuade them to go onto a moisture barrier pack. Costs a little more, health protection. The same companies who export their products, even to Africa, use the moisture barrier packing. In India, they feel it's good enough to use PVC packing. When I met them, I said, why do you do this? It's against the law. Actually, because you should test your product for two years for stability and efficacy. They said, well, look, in India, <coughs> the product is off the shelf before three months. Why should we bother? So we followed up at where this product which goes off the shelf goes to. Many housewives, after the first bit of the medicine is over, they store that blister pack in the bathroom. And believe me, every time somebody has a hot bath in their bathroom, it's like a tropical storm. And God knows what's happening to that medicine when it's next required a few months later for a sick child or whatever. So having, we found this out because we believed that we are responsible for the whole value chain. And now we're bringing government legislation to make sure that the product is packaged properly. What's our benefit? Our turnover goes up by 30 or 40 percent. We make more money. But that is not the objective of what you restarted. Money is attractive to you if you think of seven or eight great values that you must practice at work. And I can go into those values if there's any questions from you. Besides being accountable, and remember every act you take, this is philosophy, right, in a way, has an action and a reaction on everything else happening in the world. If I was to stop this lecture abruptly and just walk out of the door, I tell you, somebody in the defense system of China will get affected. That's true, no? you've read that in books. So, you, I am accountable for everything that happens in the world. I rejoice when I hear birds sing or I see flowers. I feel I'm responsible for you know? God, God, I'm going to philosophy now, student. But God exists in all of us, doesn't he? I read a brilliant, uh, met a brilliant man in Goa who was a faith healer and he healed me, he told me what five things are wrong with me and then I said you're pure. And sure enough, I'm feeling better already. So it worked with me and ten others. And I, we asked him, what happens after you die? What happens after you die? And then you've come from the universe, you've come from energy, you've come from vibration. And when you die, you go back into that energy, that sea of energy. That made me feel a lot better. See, I have no kids. I worry sometimes, is my genetic makeup going to be passed on or not? And I console myself that my brother has a son who has joined us in business. And frankly, he's more like me than his own father, or at least shares both of us. And that reminds me of a joke. You know, when you get a son or a daughter in your family, how can you tell whether it is a circumstance of environment or that of genetic heritage that molds that new youngster. Anybody know? I'll tell you, because we're short on time. You see, if it looks like you, genetics is more strong. If it looks like your neighbor, is the environment that's at stake. <laughs> 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 so, next point is please do not cover up. Do not cover up. Be transparent. You will be respected for it.
that boss may take it out of you, but his boss is boss will respect you. And own up to mistakes. We are we, when people make mistakes and they don't own up, that leads to the biggest problems in our country later on. And in India, they tend to say it'll go away by itself, but it never itself will go away by itself. Mistakes happen everywhere, all the time. There's a story of a businessman who whose chartered accountants, very important to him, were shifting their office. So he went to the best florist in town, bought a lovely bunch of flowers, and wrote a note to him and said, it off 9 o'clock tomorrow morning is the inauguration. At 9.15, he got an agitated call from his accountants. He said, what do you mean? How can you send me a message like this? What is it? So this man ran to the florist and said, what have you done? I've ruined my relationship. The man said, sir, sir, What's happened to you is not as terrible as what happened elsewhere. Another bunch of flowers was sent to a funeral. Your bunch of flowers and that bunch of flowers, the notes got mixed up. So the flowers that reached your accountant said, best of luck, sorry, that um, deeply grieved to know of your great loss. loss. And the other one that went to the funeral said, best of luck in your new location. <laughs> so, next is planning. How to plan. Now, it's terribly important to plan. A psychologist and a sociologist got together and they figured out how do you measure seniority and experience and competence in terms of the planning function. And there's a very simple correlation. If a person needs to be advised every hour or every day on what to do next, he's operating at a very low level of competence. If you can tell him once a month what needs to be done and he does it, it's a high level of competence. If you're like Marco, who's got the job of increasing his output, installing a new factory, 300% growth in the next three or four years, it's a very high level of competence. And try and train yourself to take longer and longer time periods from the tasks that are given to you. At IBM, there's a strong, fat black lady sitting at her desk. And when I went to meet somebody there, I saw a sign on her desk. And it said, do not let lack of planning on your part constitute an emergency on my part. Right? You don't plan, it affects a lot of people in the organization. Now, colleges should teach you also, I think, how to think, how to have originality in your work. Much of what I'm telling you can be learned from books. How to have originality, how to network. I don't see anybody taking notes except one gentleman from Bangladesh. <laughs> so from I, Croatia, for the last 32 years. I beg your pardon. <laughs> But, um, you know, I, I get a feeling of great joy when I see people making notes. What is that famous saying we created, do you remember? Don't be wrong. Okay, now, how to take notes, since you're on that side. Do you take notes as the lecture proceeds in one line under the other, under the other, under the other? You know, that's not a very modern technique of making an event. Please write down the name of a book by a man called Tony Buzon, B-U-Z-O-N. And Tony Buzon wrote a book called Brain Mapping. And he has a whole system there, the book can be read in two or three hours. He had a system of on your whole page, you put notes at random depending on the subject. Many of them took that class in this room. Great. Yeah. <laughs> I don't see anyone using the <laughs> Maybe you have a normal memory. Right? Okay, the next thing you must learn as an entrepreneur or a businessman is how to make correct decisions. This is a very, very interesting book. And I shall keep it as one of my entrepreneurial secrets. Unless anybody asks you the question after a finish.
how to decide whether, let us say, you're an economist and you suddenly have a rocket scientist coming to you and he's asking you about which metal to use for the nose of the rocket. The whole decision depends on you. How do you make the right decision? There's a technique. Next is, please think long term. Don't expect immediate gratification. That is only for babies. And now we are far from being a baby. Deferring your gratification is a sure sign of maturity. In India, civil servants, and my grandfather was one, worked for the government, didn't at all appreciate immediate gratification. If you brought a pad of cash to their house, a favor to be done, it's for you. Even if you bought fruit and a bottle of biscuit, you'd consider whether it was okay or not. But, but, and some of the big houses in India now, that with the civil servant, you give him a hint that his grandchild will be educated with your money. That is certainly acceptable. The gratification is delayed beyond the generation. And that's interesting. As an entrepreneur, you delay your gratification. You can have not more achieved in between rather than grabbing for whatever you can get right now. Finally, not finally, three or four more, have confidence in yourself. In India, this is a big problem. One of our recent consultants said, your people are so bright, they're so good. Why don't they have more confidence in themselves? Why don't they really need me? And I don't know if that happened in Croatia. I believe that entrepreneurship needs a lot of push here. But this is something that you should really consider. Just have the confidence in yourself. Do it. Now, next is, please constantly use your intelligence. And I'm not talking about conventional intelligence here. I'm requesting you to be street wise without being street smart. Street smart is never the truth. But nothing stops you from being street wise. If you're street wise, you don't believe in everything people tell you. You don't necessarily believe what you read in the press. You read between the words when somebody is talking, you read, you hear between the words, you read between the lines. If you don't do that, you're not going to get very far. People will love you all the time. Um, you know, when I look at a newspaper item in the papers, I say, who planted this? Whose purpose is it serving? It didn't arrive here simply because of its newsletter. Why is this company's name mentioned there as a good example of whatever the article is talking about? And I believe, frankly, that all news is planted. Okay, now, you want to be global. It doesn't depend on, as I told you earlier, how you dress and how you eat and drink and so on. Please remember to use three words. Without those three words, you will be accepted in polite global society or any society. And the words are sorry, please, thank you. Thank you, please, sorry. That's what we keep teaching our people and I think it's done them a, a lot of good, not only with our customers globally, but with their own family members and friends. Now whatever you do, please try and do it right the very first time. We've heard all this before, do it right the first time. But please consider how much corporate time and your own company's time is wasted when people don't do things right the first time. And there are ways of ensuring that this is done. We seldom know how to expand our operational knowledge very quickly. And therefore, we don't get it right for the first time. Now, you have to build networks. As an entrepreneur, if you don't have networks of people you know, you're not going to, I think, get very far, unless you're inheriting your father's business. You know that joke about inheriting your father's business? This young, dashing man, good-looking, 
and sports cars, etc., flashing, beautiful, girl next to him, and a very rich father. So he tells this girl every time, he says, you know, you should marry me. My father is 89 years old. I'll get everything. How long do you think that's going to be in the near future? The girl listened carefully. A month later, she married his father. This is done this one before, right? Thank you. So, do it right the first time. Build your networks. You know, if you are not networking, you are not working. It's as simple as that. Now, who do you network with? We tend to do it with our close friends, with people we're in school with and college with. You can meet those guys down there, but in my opinion, they're a perfect waste of time. Because you talk the same old shit everyone knows. You should build a network of contacts who are unlike you, who have pockets of knowledge, who have competences that you don't have, who have networks that you don't have. So that at the end of a telephone call, you can get the information on how to do it right the first time. So cultivate such people, not people that you like and know. Now whatever you do finally, please do it skillfully. Makes a little more time, care and thinking. Don't do it in a sloppy fashion. Learn how to do it skillfully. Watch others. Deep concentration is required on doing a job skillfully. And in my humble opinion, such concentration on work qualifies as meditation. It qualifies as the deepest yogic philosophy. Skillfully. I will end with a little bit of a story again. And that is, a man got newly into prison. He noticed something very funny on the second day. That somebody would call out a number, and everybody in the prison would start laughing. So somebody said 349, ho, 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 laughter. Somebody else said 26, huge laughter from the corridor. This went on and on. So he asked his cellmate, he said, what is this going on? He said, well, look, in our jail prison library, we have only one book. Only one book. And it's a joke book. And all the jokes are numbered. So we simply call out a number, and everyone laughs. So he said, I want to learn this. So he went to the library for two days. He studied all the jokes. He came back. Somebody was already telling one of those jokes and everyone was laughing. Then came his turn. He said, 429. <laughs> Silence. Turned around to his fellow and said, what happened? Why didn't they laugh? He says, look, you don't know how to tell a joke skillfully. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.